You're listening to the Breakaway Breakdown Podcast, where we bring you interviews with some of the top ropers in the country, news about what's going on in the fastest sport on dirt, training tips for you and your horses, and so much more. I'm your host, Casey Allen. Let's jump in. Hey, you guys. So for today's episode, I got to sit down with a young cowgirl who has already had a lot of attention on her career. She has multiple titles to her name in the Texas High School Rodeo Association. She won the 2020 Vegas Stars Roping. And more recently, you may have seen her at this little rodeo called The American. She qualified on two different runs through to the contender round. She won the semifinals. And she advanced all the way to AT&T Stadium. She's only 17 years old to top it all off. I'm talking about Cadence Crawford. And yes, Cadence is the daughter of Charlie and Jackie Crawford. So you can imagine that... Her life has been a little non-conventional up to this point. Cadence and I talk about how she got to where she is today, what it's like living in the Crawford household, because it can be a little chaotic, and we just talk about things like her practice schedule, how she tunes her horses up, how she tunes herself up, and honestly, her outlook on life at such a young age is truly remarkable. So... (laughs) We may get a little off topic a few times because I think Cadence and I both forgot that we were recording a podcast a few times throughout the call. Um, We just had way too much fun talking about everything under the sun. So I hope that you guys learn as much and have as much fun as I did recording this podcast while you're listening. Remember that this episode is brought to you by our friends at Equinity, and I cannot wait to tell you more about that supplement at the commercial break. I know you guys are tired of hearing me talk, so let's just jump right in and get to it. Hey, Cadence, what are you up to today? I am actually headed to the lake to boat with some friends. Fun, fun. Well, all right, guys, so I really wanted to bring Cadence on the podcast because She kind of cleaned up at this little rodeo called the American. Um, So I wanted to kind of get the background on things and hear about the experience from her point of view. Um, So Cadence, walk me through that week at the American and what it was like competing with everybody you had to go up against there. It was amazing. It was a busy two weeks. It started out at the semifinals um, where I got two spots to qualify there. Uh, I was a couple holes out of making it on both runs so I bought back and um I won third in the buybacks so that got me two spots back to the purse and I competed a Tuesday night which was the first purse and I was a two flat and a two one so it sent me pretty good in the average I was first and third in the average and um they only take one spot back to the contender round so I think I was good and um throughout the week I kept my spots um I ended up winning the semifinals, and then I came back to the contender round, which I got to qualify. Or I get to rope against the top ten in the world, which is Jackie, of course. So that was pretty fun. We had some trash talking going that week, and uh, we made it fun, though. It was it was definitely an experience that I'm never going to forget. And having her in my corner and my dad and everybody else that was there for me was amazing. And I ended up winning the contender round, which got me to AT&T, and I mean, it's been a dream of every single girl at Breakaway Ropes to make it to the American and rope in AT&T. And to actually walk down that tunnel and compete in the AT&T Stadium is unreal. And um, even though it didn't go the way I wanted it to go or planned on it going, it was still an amazing experience. And I got to do it with my family and friends and win some money along the way as well. Awesome. So one thing that I wanted to talk about Um, Because I think that people imagine, you know, living with Charlie and Jackie, that, like, you have just all these extra opportunities that, like, nobody else can have, and you're out there running, like, 400 calves a day, you know. And I talked to Jackie after the American, and she actually said that you guys had very different practice schedules leading up to the American. She mentioned that you didn't really want to run live calves. You had kind of a different perspective on things, and I would love to hear about how you practiced for the American and kind of stayed on your game throughout all those rounds. So about a week before the semifinals, um, I pulled my good calf horse, Kid Rock, out of the pasture, and he could not walk. 
Um, so I threw him in the trailer and I hauled butt to the vet and we had no idea what was going on. He couldn't move his back end at all. Could not move his back end at all. So I didn't know if he broke his back, pinched a nerve. We had no idea. And I was praying for the best. Well, sure enough, the vet feels around and said it was an abscess in his back foot, which he was putting most of his weight on his right foot. And that was what was making it so sore. He didn't want to put weight on his back end. I was like, well, perfect. That'll pop in no time. So I soaked him, whatever. Well, a couple of days before the semifinals, he was still super sore. Like I was trying to run calves on him and he just wasn't working. And I didn't want to push him if he was still sore. So I actually roped the Smarty every day leading up to the semifinals. And I got to the semifinals. I gave him some view just in case he still had some soreness. Um, and he he was amazing. Like, that, that, that horse is so athletic, and he was so good. Great start. Knocked the start out every single time. Gave me a shot to be fast. And leading up all the way to the American, I only roped the Smarty Dummy on him. I kept him in his lane. I ran him all the way up in there, roped, freed him up a little bit. I would throw some fast shots on him. Just I could also work on my roping. I could work on the things that I wanted to work on and while exercising him, but keeping him from going full blast and roping calves. And after that, after the American, I turned him out, let him relax for about a week. And then I went back to it. Awesome. So how important is that in your roping to really go back to the fundamentals, rope the dummy, you know, because so I'm from Pennsylvania and we had to drive like an hour and a half to get on calves back there And I've always heard people kind of use that as an excuse, you know, if they can't run calves a few times a week, um, you know, that kind of holds them back. But, like, what would you say to that? And how much do you rope the dummy and the sled compared to live cattle? I rope the dummy and the sled on my good horse a lot because he is one that his mind and his body goes a thousand miles per hour. And roping the dummy makes him slow down and think and relax and realize okay like I can just calm down I can just go slow I can just go one speed and it not make him go full on out on a real life calf and then I also get to rope on my fundamentals and rope the dummy I can rope the dummy 20 30 times when I can't rope 30 or 20 calves on my good horse you know what I mean so Getting able to have that many loops while exercising him, while working on him, just relaxing and calming down to where that when I do run a calf and I need to take three or four swings and I just need to go catch the rope and he's not trying to run past the calf or he's not trying to get tight. He's relaxed to where I can take my shot and then he shuts the run down. And yes, I think that roping live calves on your horses will keep them tuned up, but I very rarely rope live calves on that horse. Um, if anything, I'll just rope slow ones. And it just depends on what I'm getting ready for. Um, if I'm getting ready for a walk and fresh setup like I did last week, I'll set the scoring line up and see the cabs out, and then I'll run down and go get them. If I'm working on north side, I'll set the box up to north side, and I'll throw a couple loops, but I don't run more than five on that horse at all, maybe three or four times a week. If anything, I'm just exercising, slow working, making sure he's staying confident and sound and still getting exercise because he'll get chubby if I don't, but... <laughs> Just making sure he stays good while I'm also working on myself. So going into an event like the American, I mean, you're 17 years old, you're going against people of all ages there. What, as a younger competitor, what is going through your mind in those setups and those situations? Before you Honestly, go? being as young and green as I am, um, I was, I was nervous the first day of the semifinals, I was nervous because I knew more than anything I wanted to make it to the American. I wanted that title to be on my resume. I wanted to make it to the American. But after I showed myself at the semifinals that I just can go have fun and I can go rope and I can trust my horse that he's going to work underneath me and I can trust my muscle memory that I've been working hard enough and roping the dummy enough that just go out there and catch and see where it falls. But when I walked down that tunnel at at and you can bet my heart was thumping a little bit I was like holy smokes this is the real deal this is no joke there's millions of people watching on tv right now and I'm not gonna lie with the last name I had and the only mother daughter competing against each other there was cameras there was interviewers there was everything just all eyes on me and Jackie and I'm just sitting there trying okay 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 don't embarrass yourself just go out there catch the calf (laughs) and I'm just almost overthinking everything and my dad just comes up and he sees me and I'm just like like 
walking my horse around, just trying not to talk or make eye contact with anybody because I'm just trying to focus. And he comes up and he's like, Cadence, you've been roping good. Your horse is working good. Trust your fundamentals and just go rope and go have fun. There's nothing else you can do. Which the calf I had split the gates and ran and I needed to be a 2-6 and I was a little late and was playing catch up. But for the most part, I just trusted the fact that I've worked hard and my horse is working good underneath me. And I showed everybody in the contender round that I deserve to be there and that's all I could trust. And I mean, you know, having kind of like you mentioned, having the last name that you do, you know, I feel like you guys had so much press during the American and so much going on. And, you know, how have you worked to kind of carve out your own name and not just, you know, hey, I'm Charlie and Jackie's daughter. Like, no, I'm Cadence Crawford. You know, how do you handle that kind of pressure? Well, everybody kind of knows me as um, Charlie and Jackie's daughter. They'll come up and be like, aren't you Charlie and Jackie's daughter? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, I am. You know, I'm cool, too, you know. <laughs> uh, um, but, no, it's good because, honestly, without the press that they get, um, it would be so much harder for me to get my name out there. And I already have such an advantage with them being my parents that, uh, my name's already kind of out there. Like, people already know who I am. When I show up places, like, oh, that's Charlie and Jackie's daughter, which, yes, I would like to be known as, oh, that's Cadence Crawford. But at the same time, it does come up with very good opportunities. I meet a lot of very nice and very high-end people, and I wouldn't get to do that if I didn't have them by my side. For sure. And then one thing I wanted to touch back on you said about adjusting your boxes for different setups um a lot of people listening probably don't know about your guys's kind of unique boxes at the house can you explain that setup so tommy eans does all of our welding work um he set the boxes up to where we have pipe boxes um you can set them up to any single um box in the world if you wanted to you can move the back end where it's 16 foot long or 13 foot long you can move the side where it's 10 foot wide or it's 12 foot wide you can move it from any size you can rope it you can even take them out if you wanted to practice penalty setup like they made everything to maneuver to whatever box you're setting up so we set up north side um box before the semifinals and we ran calves out of the north side box so i did before my horse decided to get crippled but or we can set it back, like before Houston, we set it back to the Houston box. So we'll just text the judges and be like, hey, um, what are the box dimensions at Houston or at Rodeo Austin or whatever? They'll send you back the measurements and we can move it and rope exactly how the box is at wherever we're going to practice. I think that's so cool. That's just such a little detail that I found so interesting with your guys' practice setup. I just love that. Um, I do. It's very handy. Awesome. And then, okay, so being 17 years old, you know, what is your school situation looking like, and how do you balance that with competition, rodeoing, all that good stuff? So my parents have honestly spoiled me because I go to a <laughs> private academy called Whitehorse, and I can do all my school at home. So I do about schoolwork for about a month, and I can literally finish my entire year. So I on rainy days or days where it's too hot at the beginning of the year, whatever, I can just sit in the house, knock out all my schoolwork. It takes me about a month to finish the year, and then I don't have to worry about school after that. So for the last four years of high school, that's literally how my high school career has been. And I can go – I don't have to go to school. I can – all throughout the week, I can go to work. I can go to ropings. I can go do whatever I need to do and still graduate with a high school diploma, obviously, because it's a high school. Um I think college is going to be a little bit different because I'm actually going to have to go to class and remember to, like, actually show up to class and go. But uh, <laughs> for the most part, having that access of not having to go to school to where I can just rope all day if I wanted to um, has been very handy. And that's awesome, but, though. And, I mean, you're still willing to put in the work. You just have it on a different schedule. I think that's really unique. Yes, ma'am. Cool, cool. So, you know, what would you say to other younger competitors that, you know, are trying to balance school, trying to balance rodeo, work, different things? You know, how do you kind of keep focus with all the distractions that you have to deal with at jackpots and rodeos and things like that? 
Because it's not oh. easy for uh, younger competitors in high school and college to focus on the job at hand all the time. <laughs> yes, definitely a younger mind um, struggles. I've always struggled with my mental game. When it comes down to it, just remembering to stay strong and remembering to trust your hard work and your practice sessions. But the more I went, the more I kept going, the more confident I was getting to where I was like, wow, I can compete against Jackie and JJ and Larry D and Shelby and all these veterans because I'm just as talented as them. I just have to remember that. So even when it comes down to it and you're juggling school or you're juggling work, always put the time in. Even though if you come back from work and it's 10 o'clock at night, rope the dummy 15, 30 times just so you got your opening for that day. And then if you don't work till 10 o'clock, wake up in the morning, rope calves. Whatever it is that you can do to squeeze it in. And not saying that you have to rope every single day, all day long, to be the greatest in the world. There's a lot of things that Jackie has going on in the day. If it's interviews, if it's photo shoots, if it's lessons, if it's people just showing up to come and rope, or if there's just people showing up at the house, she juggles 50,000 things a day, but still makes time for a roping. I wake up and I get my stuff done. I go to work. I come home. I practice. I kind of just do my own thing throughout the day. But then we can go to ropings together. It's like, all right, this is our job. This is what we do for a living. This is how we make our money. So no distractions. This is game time, pretty much. Awesome. So you kind of separate things. Separate the chaos from work. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. Awesome. So tell me about Kid Rock, because there's an interesting story there, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, there is. So Kid Rock, um, he, we bought him from Wide Imus, my parents did, for actually my sister, Cheyenne Britton. And uh, I owned her horse, Pegas, that we bought from Tiba Smith. And Pegas is a little bit older, and... Um, he, I was just kind of saving him. He's a great, he's a great horse, but he's a very push style horse. He's not like you throw, he's going to say, Whoa, I'm stopping. He's not like, okay, I'm going to stay free. My sister rides very aggressive. So Pegas almost fit her style where as I want to use my rope and not have to kick and push the whole time where Kid Rock fit me. But we were, I was doing good. She was doing good on Kid Rock. I was doing good on Pegas. Well, one day my dad goes, Hey, girls, why don't y'all switch horses for the day and just practice on these horses and see because I was struggling with keeping Pegas free and she was struggling keeping Pegas like to or Kid Rock to stop so we were just like, well let's just switch our styles, you know and it was great she got along with Pegas amazing I got along with Kid Rock I hauled him all summer, he got used to me and when we clicked, we clicked and now we have been inseparable since. He make sure that I'm confident he's never going to short me. He's never going to do anything wrong. He's going to always stay in my hand. He's going to run up to the calf and he's going to stop when I tell him to stop. If I don't want him to stop, he'll keep going. If I want him, like he always listens to my hand and he makes sure that I don't have to worry about him. I can just go out and worry about my roping. He's incredibly special. Awesome. And so another thing I think is interesting is I think a lot of people assume that you were just born with a rope in your hand like you just came out roping you know because you're Charlie's Charlie's daughter um but you said you just started roping six or seven years ago yes ma'am so I lived in Oregon and I played sports I like did a little bit of peewee rodeo and like I had an Appaloosa pony that was kind of crazy um <laughs> kind of tried to kill me every time <laughs> we ran barrels or ran poles but that's where I learned to love rodeo is uh go to the little peewee rodeos and seeing the people that were still pro rodeo in, in Oregon, which of course the rodeos down here are way more, there's way more rodeos, there's way more ropings than up north, um, just because it's the cowboy state pretty much. So I moved down here when I was 12 years old and I moved in with my dad and Jackie and, um, I still played sports. I played basketball and ran track and um, did cross country and all those things. Well, um, Jackie, my dad, said, okay, like if you're wanting to rope and you're wanting to team rope and breakaway rope seriously, then we got to pick because I come home from practice at 530 is pretty dark, so I couldn't rope. 
I had tournaments on the weekends. I like sports was just taking up most most of my time when I knew I wanted to rope. I knew I didn't want to play sports for the rest of my life. So they bought me a good horse. I started going to ropings. It's about six or seven years ago. Um, six. It was about six years ago. Coming on seven, and decided, okay, this is what I want to do. And I, I don't run barrels. I don't do any of that. I'm strictly roping, and that's what I've stuck to for the last however many years. Playing sports when you were younger, is there a crossover with other sports that helped you with rodeo? Like, did you learn things while you were playing other sports that kind of helped you along when you started roping? Oh, yeah. It sure uh, teaches you how to work hard. teaches you that if you want something, that you have to work for it. I definitely was not going to be able to run two miles without practicing. I was gonna, I would die. <laughs> so, <laughs> going to practice every day, I wouldn't know how to dribble a basketball or shoot if I didn't practice every day. So knowing that if you want something hard enough, you have to practice for it. You have to work hard for it. And having teammates is teaching you how to travel with people in rodeo. You have to get along with people. You have to work as a team. Um, having a coach means you admire other people's advice. And I think that growing up playing sports did teach me how to work hard. And awesome. I don't know. It taught me how to compete. And if I wanted to win, I had to work for it. Hey guys, so this episode is brought to you by the great folks over at Equinity. Equinity is one of my favorite companies and I use the products for my breakaway horses. Uh, Equinity Horse XL is a 100% pure amino acid supplement. There's nothing added that your horse doesn't need. It can help improve their muscles. It can help them recover faster after workouts. It helps improve collagen so your horse can have healthier coat and bones. And it maximizes your performance because it helps cells regenerate at a faster rate. That means fast recovery for those fast twitch muscles that you need to explode out of the box and stop hard at the end of a run. They also have Equinity Ultimate OEC, and I love this supplement. I didn't think Equinity could get any better until I started using it. It has flaxseed-based omega-3 oil, natural vitamin E, and colloidal silver. It can help support your horse's cardiovascular health, their joint health, gastric health, and it increases their immune support. So if you're traveling up and down the road a lot, that's something that's super important for your horse. Visit teamequinity.com to learn more about these supplements and see how you can get some for yourself. Now, talk me through when, it was a few years ago, when Charlie announced that he was retiring from Pro Rodeo and he turned his focus, you know, kind of to you and Jackie. And what did that mean to you, number one, as a daughter, but number two, to have a coach full time with your dad being home more? Oh, dad's the best trophy dad slash husband you could find. He's going to call you from Mexico to freaking Canada if you asked him to. Um, he went with me all summer long, never complained that we were going to five rodeos a weekend, that we had to go to Shawnee, Oklahoma, to Gallup, New Mexico. Like, he was always there. He was always in the rig, always making sure that I had a positive attitude and was always just pushing me to be better. I could break out and miss a calf eight times in a row and he's still he's never going to get on to me he's never going to make me feel bad for losing he already knows it sucks enough on yourself when you don't win so he was just always there to be supportive and happy and cheer you on and make sure that you have the fun in it because a lot of people don't see the fun in rodeo like you're getting to do what some so many people wish they could do but they make it as okay this is your job so you have to take it serious you can also have fun if you're not having fun then what's the point of doing it And that's something that my dad taught me. And he's also great. Drove all over the place for Jackie. He's made sure the kids were taken care of. Ever since he retired, which I can tell he missed it a little bit, he amateur rodeoed with me a little bit last summer. And getting to go to the BFI this year and Rodeo Houston and entered some small pro rodeos. And you can tell he was missing it, but he also loves the joy on my face when I do good or when Jackie does good. And he's also there for that aspect of things. He loves being supportive and making sure that we can follow our dreams because he did it for 30 years. So it's our time to shine now. And he just loves being there for all of it. That's so fun. And then on the flip side, I know it's not always easy having your parents as coaches, but how do you guys kind of keep all your relationships, you know, 
doing well in the practice pen, I guess. And how do you deal with having your parents as coaches also? Well, being a teenager, you're never going to listen to your parents. You're always going to think they're wrong and that you know more than they do. <laughs> and so having them as my parents, I have to realize, okay, yeah, they do know more than I do. But Jackie will tell me something a hundred times over, and until I actually figure it out and think I came up with it myself, then I'll admit she's right. But I had to come up with it for myself first. And then she'll be like, huh, that's funny. I think I told you that a hundred times before. And dad's the same way. Which when dad and I practice, we get, he keeps it very fun. He keeps it very enlightening. And so does Jackie. But Jackie's also juggling people calling her and riding eight horses a day. First road, she'll be like, hey, keep your tip up on this one. And we'll just go rope. When dad and I rope on the team roping side, on the team open arena, he makes it fun. Like, we can ride colts together. We can, because he's not juggling the chaos that Jackie's juggling. So when Jackie's, like, not has 8,000 things going on, we'll listen to music. We'll make it fun. We'll just do anything to make us laugh. And they're, the, they're paid to be coaches. So when I finally am like, okay, like, let's rope today. They make it about me. My dad will be like, all right, this is Cadence's time. I'll come and push the calves. He'll get in the chute and push calves just so that I feel the realistic go at a rodeo. Or Jackie will be behind me filming. Or Jackie will be writing calves down or timing me or something that gets me ready for it. But they've already been through all of the – they're already seasoned. So they know exactly how to help me without going through all the hardships. They can just be like, all right, here's what you need to do, and this is how we're going to accomplish it. And then they make sure I get there. That's awesome. So, I mean, you've said a few times, you know, the, the chaos around the Crawford household. How do you guys kind of balance everything? I mean, you guys do so much and have so many different directions with all the kids and all the business and the horses. How do you guys, like, balance that? <laughs> we don't balance it. There's no balance. There's no, there's no nothing. It's pure <laughs> chaos all the time, 24-7. But we make, we make do. Um, my grandma's actually here right now, so she can help us out with the kids because Jackie's fixing to leave for California, and Dad's giving lessons every day, and I kind of just do my own thing. I rope and ride horses and go to work and help them when they need help. They help me when I need help. But when I tell you there's probably 20 different rigs pulling out of that house every single day with people we don't even know showing up, or Jackie's getting 5,000 phone calls, or my dad has to go to a meeting in Dallas, or... I have to go take a horse to the vet or watch the kids. Like most families, like, you know, kind of like plan their day out and be like, all right, this is what we're going to no, we, we, we can't do that because that plan is going to get changed about 5,000 times before our day is over. Yeah. What is uh, Jackie up to? Like 600 unan unanswered text messages. Oh my goodness. <laughs> she has three different emails and I'm pretty sure there's like 8,000 notifications on every one of those emails. Her texts are insane. Her voicemails and calls, like we went to Louisiana together, and she was probably on the phone most of the time. And I'm like, who are you? Who are you talking to? Like, you need to get an agent, just where they can answer all these phone calls, and you can just like not have to do this because she'll put her phone in her bra and rope while she's on the phone with somebody. <laughs> and I'm like, Jacqueline, that is ins like that's insane. But that's what she has to do. There's so many people that call her in a day that. If she didn't do that, she wouldn't get back to any of them. Yeah, you'd think with those American winnings, she could, like, get a set of AirPods or something, headphones. She loses them. She can't even keep her head on her shoulders, nonetheless, two little AirPods. Oh, my goodness. So you guys just kind of hit the ground running and hope for the best. Oh, yeah. We <laughs> hope to not fall or break something in the mix. Oh, that's awesome. Um, okay, so looking forward, I mean, what are your plans? You talked about college a little bit. Do you have a school picked out? You know, what are your, are you going to rope full time? What's, what's going on with your future? So I signed to Rodeo for Ranger College um, in this fall. I'm going to go for two years and then I'm going to transfer to Tarleton State University and get a degree in business and marketing. And I plan on the pro rodeo the second I turn 18 and go out and try to make finals as many times as I can, but still getting a degree and still focusing on my academics side of things and making sure that I always have something to fall back on because you can't just think that you're going to rodeo for the rest of your life and that's you're going to be fine. One day you're going to get old. 
one day you might get crippled. One day you never know what's going to happen. So I want to have a degree that I can fall back on. And when dad retired, he started buying um, rental places. So he was making a little bit of side profit. And he has that rope in, that military rope in. So he puts most of his time in on that. And I just want to always make sure that no matter if I'm done rodeo and I still have a way to make money and a way to supply for a family one day. So I don't want to just surround my life around pro rodeo for the rest of my life because reality hits, you're not going to be able to do that for the rest of your life. Yeah. And I mean, how cool is it now that you, as a breakaway roper, you can actually plan to have a career for at least a, you know, a period of time in the breakaway roping and you've got to see it firsthand kind of what's going on with the sport with Jackie as one of the front runners. I mean, just oh, yeah. speak to that a little bit. Well, about three or four years ago, most breakaway ropers, their career was over after college. You could break away throughout college, but there's nowhere else to go with it. So most people got a job, had a family, you know, but now you can make the finals and you can dang your, make a living breakaway roping. Like I was looking at the books with Cheyenne the other day and, Almost half of all the pro rodeos, if not more, have added breakaway rope in this year. Like, they're seeing that this is one of the fastest growing events in rodeo, and everybody wants to jump on top of it. And when you can win, heck, I had a chance to win $2.1 million just with a rope. Not very many 17-year-olds could say they had a chance to win $2.1 million. And you can go to Rodeo Houston, win 50000 You can win the American, if you're in the top 10 in the world, and win 100000 Like... There's just so many opportunities for such good money that our, us breakaway ropers never thought that was going to be a thing. Which I'm very glad and I'm very thankful for Jackie and Larry D and JJ and everybody that was involved, all the rodeo communities that saw a future in breakaway roping to where now us younger girls, Maddie, Josie, me, Aspen Miller, everybody can see that there's a future in this that we can make a living with a rope, just like the guys can. That's awesome. So... Okay, I want to break down some technical things because this is the breakaway breakdown and as much fun as we're having, we got to talk about the technical stuff. Um, so tell me, what are some things in your roping right now that you're working on specifically? Um, like the actual fundamentals of like exactly what I'm working on? Oh, yeah. I want to get into okay. it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've always struggled with dropping my elbow when I deliver, which makes the rope come back up and I can either top knot a lot of calves or I rope very deep. So what Jackie and I have been working on for a while now, which um, comes like here and there, like some days I won't do it. Some days I'll revert back to my old habits, but staying with your swing and coming just straight out of it, straight to the deck, not dropping down, not making any extra movements, just coming straight up from your swing, straight to your delivery. And that makes me, I have such long arms and I'm so tall that I have such a long range, but I was almost cutting it off by dropping my elbow or doing so many extra moves with my arm instead of just coming straight out of my swing and straight to the calf neck. So we work on that a little bit. Um, I've worked on staying in the front of my saddle and not getting thrown back or sitting down too soon and cutting off my delivery and completely riding my horse up underneath me to where when I pull my slack, he knows, okay, when I pull my slack and I'm dramatic with it, that means to stop, not stopping when I'm throwing, not stopping anytime. He knows to stop when I drag that slack back and staying aggressive with my swing, making sure I have power on my swing at all times, having to break my rope and heading. There's so many similar, there's so many similar things to it, but there's so many different things to it. So like when I go, when I'm break my rope and I go back to heading, I'll almost drop a coil when I don't need to, or when I, I'm heading for a couple weeks and I go back to break my open, I flatten my swing out and I drop my elbow. So like learning to defer both of those events has been something that me and my dad have been working on. Um, we'll set up a, he come up with this fun little game where the calf roping dummy is headed like North or whatever. And the team roping dummy is like headed South. So we'll race me and him will race, which I've yet to beat him on the racing part of it. But We'll rope the calf dummy five times as fast as you can, as fast as you can. Turn around, run to the team rope and dummy, grab the team rope, rope the team rope and dummy five times as fast as you can. If we tie, it's timed. If he misses the calf rope and dummy and I caught all of them, then I win. So that's a little bit of 
like I can work on my calf roping, but then I can also switch it up in a second and work on my team roping. So we worked on that a little bit. So that's pretty fun. And then is there anything else with your horses that you've been working on? Um, or your riding, keeping them tuned up? Um, my head horse is out right now, Sailor, which is the um, horse my dad for Yoda took to the final took to the finals. Um, he's crippled right now, so I haven't been getting ahead on him much, but my dad's been letting me on some of his maturity horses that he rides um, at the rope horse maturity. And I have, I just bought a new four-year-old that's going to be, he's a little guy, so he's going to be a breakaway prospect. And then I got Kid Rock, and I can jump on a couple practice horses if I need to, but making sure that my good ones always stay good and I'm not overusing them to where they get sore, they don't like their job, has always been something that my parents have taught me since the beginning. Jackie will never run more than four, five or six on her good ones, ever. Never. And I won't do that on Kid Rock or Sailor. If I need practice, I'll get on a practice horse and run about eight or nine and just get throws. But then you can also go back to the dummy and work on yourself instead of using your horsepower and wasting all the things that you need to work on with your horses. So you can keep them wanting to work and keep them sound and having tried. Because if you rope 15 or 20 steers on a head horse, they're eventually not going to want to work for you anymore. They're like, no, heck with this. But I want to keep them to where they love their job and they want to keep working so that I know that, like, I mean, they're your teammate. They're, they're the athlete that's underneath you. So when you want them to do their job so that you can do your job, they, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So there's two things that I kind of like to ask everybody on here. Number one, what is the best piece of roping advice you have ever been given? That you can always dream, but you can never dream too big. If there's a will, there's a way. And Jackie's always preached on that. If you want to do something, there's always a way. So never think that your dreams are too small or you can't rope against the veterans or you're never going to be good enough. They started from somewhere. They came to the top. They had people help them. You can't ever be stubborn enough to where you think you can't need help. You can do this on your own. They had somebody helping them, and you need to do the same. So if you have big dreams and say you want to make the NFR one day, don't cut yourself off. If you want to do it, you can go do it. I think so many people are like, oh, I just, I don't have the horsepower. I don't have the rigs. I don't have nothing. Yes, those are great assets. But if there's a will, there's a way. If you want to do it, you can do it. I love that. I was going to ask your best piece of life advice yet, but I love that your roping and life advice was in one. That's awesome. <laughs> Because that's what it's about. I mean, it's not just about things that happen in the roping pen in life. Right. When people think of Cadence Crawford, okay, and not just as Charlie and Jackie's daughter, what do you want people to know about you? Anything else that you think we missed today? I very rarely take anything serious. <laughs> if, if there's a chance for me to crack a joke, I'm usually going to crack a joke. Um, I like to, I don't know, I always like to make things fun. There's no point in life being so serious and being so just bland. Like, if you have a way of making life fun, I'm going to try to do it. Which I'm not saying I might wake up on the wrong side of the bed one day and be grumpy, which my dad and Jackie can both attest on that. But um, <laughs> I'm always going to make a joke of some sort. I'm always going to make things funny. Awesome. I love that. Well, all right, Cadence. I had a lot of fun today. I hope I didn't grill you yeah, with too many questions. thanks for having me. <laughs> no, you're good. I'm just driving. Okay, I have one last question, Cadence. And is there anything that you would tell your 10-year-old self right now if you could? My 10-year-old self would honestly be so proud of the opportunities that I've taken and the amount that I believe in myself now. Because at 10 year old 10 years old, I never thought that I would be living in Texas and I would be an American qualifier and I would have these interviews. And when you're 10, I mean, yeah, we, we believe we can touch the sky, but you actually have to go out and do it. You have to believe in yourself. You can't think, oh, that's just too big. I, I just, I don't think I can do it. If you believe that you can do it, you're going to find a way. Awesome. Well, all right, Cadence, thanks so much for talking to me today. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. 
Awesome. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And Oh, yeah. It's finally a Sunday relaxing. We went to Louisiana and have been driving and no sleep for the last three days. So it's 93 degrees today. It's a nice day to go out in the boat. Heck, yeah. It's going to be awesome. And, you know, the wildfires have dodged you guys, so that's been good so far. Oh, yeah. We were extremely lucky with that. Well, all right, Cadence, you enjoy the rest of your day, and yes, thanks so much for chatting with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Well, you guys, if you ever wondered what it was like living in the Crawford household for a day, now you know. It sounds a little hectic, but you can tell that that family just supports each other so much in their goals and they have so much fun together and it was really refreshing to hear. It was also really fun getting to know Cadence and I hope that you guys enjoyed learning as much about her as I did. I also hope that you will check out TeamEquinity.com to check out Equinity's line of products because I'm telling you they are amazing and I know you'll love them when you give them a chance. Also, this podcast wouldn't be possible without them. So if you enjoyed it, make sure to go give them a like on Facebook, check out their website, and and let them know you enjoyed it. I hope everybody has a great week. Make sure to check out our bonus content that will drop next week. And make sure to listen for upcoming episodes. Thanks so much.